Um, yeah, so thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here um, this morning, really happy to be joining your conference. Um, yeah, so my name's Grace Johnson and I'm here to talk about the Hedgehog Street project um, and also the recently published State of Britain's Hedgehogs report. Um, I should mention that my web browser has started doing a really fun thing where it just crashes. Um, so if I just suddenly disappear, just bear with me and I'll just join again and I'll be back in a moment. Um, but yeah, I feel like I should just say that in case I'm just there one moment and gone the next. Um, yeah, so community conservation in action. Uh, so a little bit about what I'll be talking about today. So to start with a bit of information about hedgehogs, we all know what they are, but just to share a bit of background information, just a few interesting facts. I'll talk about the Hedgehog Street project, which is um, the project that I'm looking after. Uh, the State of Britain's Hedgehogs report, which just came out a couple of weeks back. Uh, threats to hedgehogs in the UK. Uh, the research that's going on to try to understand and mitigate those threats. Um, how we can all help and also a few case studies of things that uh, local groups are doing in parts of our work. Um, and I thought it'd be nice as well to share some um, videos as well. So we get lots of lovely videos sent in uh, by our supporters. So this is, um, this is, I always like to show this one. It's a really, it's a really funny one. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just share some videos throughout the talk as well. Um, yeah, so it always surprises me that that hedgehog can actually get through that tiny gap, but I think they're just, yeah, they're just true acrobats getting through there. Uh, yeah, so the West European hedgehog. Um, so it's one of about 18 hedgehog species in the world. Um, we've only got the one species here in Britain. Um, they are the only spiny mammal that we have, and their spines are made up of keratin, which is the same material as our hair and nails. Um, and an adult larger hedgehog can have as many as 7,000 spines on its body, which is pretty incredible for such a small species. And they do, of course, use those spines for defence, so they curl up in a ball when threatened. Uh, they're nocturnal, which of course means that they're asleep in the day and active at night. Uh, they eat a lot of different things. They are omnivorous, but in the UK it is mainly insects. So think things like beetles, earwigs, caterpillars, worms, all those creepy crawlies that you would find in the garden. Uh, but they do also occasionally make use of carrion, of fallen fruit on the ground, and also, of course, um, food that's been left out by people. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, and they do, they do hibernate as well. They're a true hibernator. So that's from November until March. And I've just put an ish on there just because, of course, hibernation can vary based on weather conditions. And we've had such a mild March and we're certainly hearing reports of active hedgehogs. So this year it's been more like sort of until January, February, but it does certainly depend on the weather. Uh, they are usually brown in colour, as you can see in that top left picture there. Um, but there are some colour variations. So you do get blonde hedgehogs um, and very occasionally you do get true albino hedgehogs as well. Um, and you can see on the map on the left hand side there um, that the species is distributed throughout Western Europe. The name's a bit of a giveaway there. Um, and it does overlap um, with other hedgehog species on the eastern border of their range. So not surprisingly, the East European hedgehog. Uh, so Hedgehog Street, this is the project that I manage. Um, so it is uh, a joint project between two British wildlife charities, the People's Trust for Endangered Species and the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. And it was set up back in 2011 in response to the quite alarming hedgehog declines that had been seen in the UK. So we did celebrate our 10th birthday last year. Uh, it's a really far reaching project. It's got a lot of different elements. I've got a few examples here in the, in the pictures along the bottom, but ultimately what we're trying to do is raise awareness of the ways that people can help hedgehogs and support people to do that. Uh, so that bottom left picture there, uh, we do attend a lot of events, um, not so much in the last couple of years for obvious reasons, but we try and get to as many online events as we can. Um, so really trying to engage with um, the general public on how they can help hedgehogs, but also trying to engage with key stakeholders. So people like ecologists, land managers, farmers, developers, and um, trying to raise awareness of the ways that people can help. Uh, the next picture along there is myself and a colleague helping out with a camera trapping research project. Uh, so we do support a number of research projects as part of Hedgehog Street, and that's to try and untangle the reasons for the hedgehog decline and look at potential solutions. Uh, so I've got a slide um, a little bit later just with a few examples of that research just so you can get a flavour of, of what's going on. Uh, the middle picture there, we do run a training course on hedgehog ecology and land management uh, and we do get a really good range of people attending that course. So we get, of course, land managers, uh, sort of people from local councils, park managers, 
Uh, we get conservation volunteers, um, people who work in wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, it's a really good mix of people. Uh, the next picture along there is our species champion, MP species champion, Chris Grayling, who works with us on um, parliamentary issues. So most recently, he's been trying to help us um, increase the legal protection for hedgehogs. Uh, and finally, that last picture, we do a lot of media interviews. So we run a lot of awareness and engagement campaigns to try and um, let people know how they can help hedgehogs. Uh, and we try and do a lot of press releases. Um, so, of course, we did one a couple of weeks back for the State of Britain's Hedgehogs report. And it does tend to, uh, it's good with hedgehogs because, of course, a lot of, you know, everybody does love them. So we tend to get a lot of um, press coverage, which is fantastic because uh, that allows us to speak to a really wide audience of people. Uh, so that's a few of the main things that we do. And we also work a lot with uh, local projects. We try and support as many local sort of Hedgehog Street projects as we can. So again, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples of those a little bit later on. Uh, as part of Hedgehog Street as well, we run the Big Hedgehog Map. Um, and that is uh, allows us to gather distribution data of hedgehogs across the UK. Uh, so we can collect records of uh, live hedgehogs, but also if they are dead or roadkill. Um, of course, that still tells us where they are, so it's really important to log those as well. Uh, the map was launched in 2015, and since then we've got over 130,000 hedgehog records. And as you can see on the map on the left-hand side there, they are a really widespread species. Of course, they are found in a lot of places, um, but it's really good to get that local detail. So you can submit records to the map, but you can also go on there. It is interactive and you can pop your postcode in and just have a, a, a little bit of a closer look at where you know, whatever area where you live, where you work, whatever it might be, just to have a look and see um, how many records have been submitted there. Uh, and it is treated as biological data. So we do share that with the MBN Atlas and various local biological record centres, um, including TVIRC. Um, and we've also got an app as well, a Hedgehog Street app, which just makes that recording a little bit easier. It just means you can get to the, get to the map and, and put your sightings on there. Um, so the State of Britain's Hedgehogs report, um, yeah, some of you may have seen this in the news. We released this, I think it was about a month ago, sort of middle end of February. Um, it was a, a long time in the making. It was uh, quite, quite a lot of work went into this. Um, so we used data from various wildlife surveys. Um, so that included two mammal surveys from the People's Trust for Endangered Species. Uh, we also had data from BTO and from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, and we used all of that to analyze um, how hedgehog populations were, how they're doing and how they're changing over time in Britain. Um, so in the 2018 report, which was the, the previous one that was published, um, it was looking as though urban populations of hedgehogs, the decline of those urban populations was starting to slow down. Um, and in this report, we really did see a continuation of that. So there's increasingly apparent differences in urban and rural areas. Um, so I'll just start with the, the sort of urban side of things. So, yeah, that trend that we saw in 2018 really did continue. And actually what we're seeing is um, a stable population that's uh, even showing signs of recovery, which is good news. Uh, rural populations, on the other hand, they do remain low. So we've got declines of between 30 and 75 percent nationally since 2000. Um, so, of course, the Hedgehog Street project is uh, primarily based in urban and suburban areas. Uh, we do do a lot of work um, in in rural areas as well, but we do. I think we just need to extend the reach of what we're doing and just try and engage with more rural land managers. Uh, so one of the surveys that contributed uh, really important data to the State of Britain's Hedgehogs report was the Living with Mammals survey, which is run by the People's Trust for Endangered Species. Um, it's a survey of the built environment, uh, so it's gardens and green spaces within 200 metres of a building. Uh, most, most of the sites that we have um, are in urban areas, but the survey is really across the whole sort of rural urban gradient. Um, so about 70 to 80 percent of the sites are domestic gardens, um, but we are quite keen to record in other types of uh, site which are typically under recorded. Uh, so this is an effort based survey. Um, so it's quite important that we get a measure of time um, that people have taken to look for mammals. Um, so the length of time that you've taken and also the time of day. So whether you've done that at dawn and um, whether it's daytime, dusk or nighttime. Uh, and the good thing about living with mammals is that there's no fixed time. It's quite a flexible survey, which does make it quite accessible, which is nice. 
Um, so it really is up to you. There's no specified minimum um, if you want to do 20 minutes a week or if you're in the garden for a bit longer and you want to sort of get more into it, you can do more than that. Um, you know, up to several hours, however long you want to do. Uh, we just need to know how long that is. So it's really important for us to know the effort because that makes it important to compare the data from year to year. Uh, so it's fantastic if people can get involved. Um, and it's even better if you can stay involved over a few seasons. That would be fantastic. Um, what's really important is that we get uh, repeat surveys of the same site. Um, so I don't want that to, to sort of be too much pressure and put people off. But um, if you're able to, to record weekly sightings, um, it's sightings or signs of mammals, I should say. Uh, so also looking for droppings and footprints and things. Um, so, yeah, if you're able to record weekly uh, sightings or signs for a couple of months, that's fantastic. Um, if you're able to do it the following the following year as well, that's even better. Um, if you miss a year, it's it's okay, it doesn't matter. Um, but just the more years, the better would be the, the sort of key message. Uh, and the reason for that is that with repeat surveys, we can be more confident about the trends, um, the trends that we're seeing. Um, and the survey does also make use of trail camera records as well. And that's, of course, you know, they're becoming more and more popular um, in recent years. Uh, so we record whether a sighting um, of a mammal was on camera or if it was in person, as it were. Um, so even less effort required. So that's a really good one to, to get involved with. Uh, so in terms of uh, why uh, we've seen these declines in, in hedgehogs sort of in the last in the last couple of decades, um, there's a lot of different threats that they're facing in the UK, unfortunately. Uh, so ag agricultural intensification is one, and that's certainly, you know, primarily in the rural landscape. Uh, so this is a process that's been going on for several decades. Um, and what we have nowadays is these large monoculture fields. There's often um, chemicals and pesticides used, really trying to maximise the output of the land. But this, of course, does limit the insect food available, but also the sheltering opportunities for hedgehogs. Um, it's estimated that we've lost 50 percent of hedgerows since the Second World War. Um, and they're, of course, really important habitat for hedgehogs, as the name suggests. Um, the People's Trust for Endangered Species do run a hedgerow project and they've got a hedgerow app where you can get fantastic management advice. So if anybody's more interested in um, hedgerows, do certainly have a look on their website. Uh, habitat loss, again, linking to that massive loss of hedgerows, um, but also there's more and more development going on, lots of land use change. Uh, there's less suitably wild and diverse areas for hedgehogs to thrive in. Uh, habitat fragmentation, uh, so even when there are suitable areas of habitat, uh, whether they're wildlife friendly gardens, parks, hedgerows, um, they are sadly often broken up um, by roads, buildings, walls, and it just means that hedgehogs can't move easily through the environment. Uh, roadkill, arguably quite a major threat to hedgehogs, and it's one of the most visible ones because, of course, we do see a lot of, you know, when you're driving around, you might see roadkill to hedgehogs, which is always really sad. Um, it's something we're still investigating in terms of the level of impact and the potential mitigation. So we've got some research going on into that. Uh, predation as well. So um, badgers are the main natural predator of hedgehogs in the UK. So hedgehogs do often avoid areas where badgers are residing. Um, but it's really important to note that it's a completely natural predator prey interaction. Um, it's been going on for thousands of years and we know that the two species can thrive alongside each other where there's enough um, enough insect prey for both species and where the conditions are good. Um, and also hedgehogs are declining in areas that are characterised by low badger numbers. So that tells us that it's not a, a major factor in the decline. It might just be having an effect at a local level. Um, and then garden hazards as well, unfortunately, are increasing an increasing problem for hedgehogs. So I've got a few examples of those along the bottom. So getting tangled in, in fencing, in, in football goal nets in the garden. Um, you see these awful pictures on social media of hedgehogs trapped in crisp packets, awful things. So, so definitely getting tangled up and obviously the spines don't help with that. Uh, bonfires as well. So we try and do engagement campaigns um, in November every year in time for bonfire night because they're starting to look for hibernation nests. Um, and of course, a big pile of logs is going to look like a perfect, a perfect spot for that. But of course, they don't know that that's about to be set on fire. Um, chemicals in the garden, you know, they're going to um, reduce the amount of natural prey for them, but then it can cause problems if they do ingest it directly as well. Um, and then strimmers and lawnmowers, which uh, hedgehog rescues all over the UK do report these awful, awful injuries every summer. And that's a real 
it's a shame with that one because it's no one's doing that deliberately but it's just all it takes is that awareness just have a quick look in the grass in this area that you're strewing just look before you do it and that's going to avoid these accidents so again really trying to get the word out about that and just encourage gardeners to to be really careful when they are gardening Uh, so we've talked a bit about the threats to hedgehogs, but it's really important for us to understand how significant these are and how they all link together and how they're varying in different areas as well. Um, so to that end, we support several research projects trying to untangle uh, the factors behind the hedgehog decline and also potential solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of projects going on at the moment. Um, there's even more that have gone before. But I've just picked out a few examples here just to give you a, a flavour of, of the things that we're looking at. Uh, so the first project um, towards developing evidence-based conservation strategies for urban hedgehogs in the UK, that's by Abby Gazard at the University of Reading, and she's pictured at the top left there. Um, she actually submitted her thesis yesterday, so she's she's had a bit of a, a bit of a hectic couple of weeks getting everything ready, but that's that's really good news. So that's um a project that's been going on for a few years. So it'll be really good to, to get some information from that. Um, so Abby's looking I say looking, she's been collecting um, evidence to demonstrate the impact of increasing garden connectivity on hedgehog movement. Um, so this idea of hedgehog highways, hopefully some people have, have heard of these. So it's small gaps in fences to allow hedgehogs to get through. So Abby's been looking at those and um, how they're used and their importance. Uh, she's also been looking at why and how hedgehogs use certain gardens. Uh, so the factors behind that. Um, and finally, she's been looking at hedgehog overwinter activity in urban areas. So if we keep leaving supplementary food out for them over winter, it's that does that help them or does that hinder the natural hibernation process? Uh, the next uh, project is a bit of a wordy one, untangling the roles of prey availability, habitat quality and predation as predictors of hedgehog abundance. And um, this is another one that actually has been submitted. So hopefully that'll be published soon and we can get some results up on the Hedgehog Street website. Um, so essentially that one's looking at the relationship between badgers, hedgehogs and their environment. Um, and then finally, road impacts for the West European hedgehog. That's being done by Lauren Moore. She's put, pictured at the bottom left there. She's got, just got loads of hedgehogs. She's just good at finding them. Um, so this project has a few different objectives. Uh, so Lauren's going to be looking to determine the proportion of hedgehogs that are killed on roads each year because it's really important to get that information. Uh, the factors affecting hedgehog road mortality and um, how roads can isolate populations. So, of course, roads have the direct impact of, of sort of killing individuals, you know, when they're when they sort of have collisions with cars. Um, but roads have this secondary impact of actually breaking up populations and sort of causing them to become quite isolated and potentially more vulnerable. Um, and also the value and efficacy of tunnels under roads for hedgehogs, which um is is the sort of testing solutions element of her of her work so that'll be really interesting because there are being there's tunnels being built under roads um on development sites for protected species so things like great crested newts and badgers so it's trying to investigate whether those can also benefit hedgehogs are they using those tunnels so that's going to be really interesting when we've got some results of that Uh, so that's a bit about the the kind of wider ways that we're helping so so trying to understand the the declines and um, but the good thing about hedgehogs is that there's a lot of different things that people can do in their own gardens to help and it's it's quite simple things it doesn't have you don't have to have a huge garden and all these expensive features it's really quite simple things that can make a big difference for hedgehogs uh, so i mentioned before this idea of hedgehog highways um so that's uh, about 13 centimeters up and across um about the size of a cd case if anybody still has those lying around the house that's a good guide to use um, you can dig a channel under the fence if that's a bit easier and um, but essentially what we're trying to do is link as many gardens together and as many green spaces just trying to link gardens um to the wider environment uh, we know that hedgehogs can travel a, a mile or two in a single night so no one garden is big enough we want to try and um, link as, as much of the environment as much of our landscape as possible um, having a bit of a messy corner, so just choose an area of the garden um, you know, just just let it grow completely wild, leave it undisturbed, just nice wildflowers, lovely long grass. That's going to increase um, the invertebrate prey for them um, and also provide nesting opportunities. Um, so that's quite a nice one because it involves no effort at all. Just choose an area of the garden and let it be wild. 
Uh, wildlife features, so things like log piles, leaf piles, compost heaps, and um, having a wildlife pond. So again, all of those things are going to increase the amount of um, insects. And you can always record those to, to TVIRC as well, let them know about the invertebrates that you've been seeing. And um, the only thing with a wildlife pond is just to bear in mind that hedgehogs are quite good swimmers, but if they do fall into a high-sided pond and they get stuck, they might not be able to find their way out. So just make sure to either have a sloping side so they can sort of walk out if they need to, um, or put in a little access ramp for them just so something a bit like a plank of wood with a bit of chicken wire on just so they can climb out if they, if they do fall in. Uh, removing litter and hazards, so we touched on those earlier, um, so just making sure there's no um, plant netting, you know, at a level where hedgehogs could get to, just try and uh, sort of tie that up so it's out of the way so they're not going to get tangled. Um, drip cover sort of open drains because, again, they can get trapped in things like that. Uh, removing chemicals from the garden, certainly try and uh, minimise um, the amount of chemicals that you're using. Uh, hedgehog houses, so you can buy these online or you can um, build one if you've got a bit of spare time. We do have plans on the Hedgehog Street website to, to build your own hedgehog house. Um, and we say to people, you know, you've got to put those in the garden and, and leave them for a little while. The hedgehogs have got to get used to them. Um, but then I do hear a lot of stories where people have, have sort of put them in the garden and then there's a hedgehog living in it that, that same night. So I think they, they do they do seem to know that it's there for them, which is quite nice. Uh, getting neighbours involved as well. So just chatting to your neighbours and, you know, just sort of saying, oh, I think there's I think there's hedgehogs. Have you, you know, can we try and open up the gardens, really try and, and get as, um, as many people involved as possible? Uh, and also supplementary food is a really nice one. That's that's a nice way to help them, because, of course, they're natural. Um, their natural insect prey, um, you know, might be in short supply in certain areas. So that extra food can just supplement their natural diet. So just keep into things like meaty cat or dog food um, and a shallow dish of clean, fresh water. Um, and that's that's going to help them. And also that's going to increase your chances of actually seeing a hedgehog, which is lovely. Um, so we've got a nice um, video here. I don't know if the sound's going to come through, but yeah, this is just um, they are solitary. They're not they, they don't sort of. Um, they don't travel in groups, but I think if you leave food in the garden, you, you're potentially going to get a few visiting, which is quite nice. Um, I just love this video because it's a nice, clear one. So, yeah, it's just that meaty cat or dog food. You know, you can get specialist hedgehog food, but you, you don't even need that. Just sort of com those kind of complete formula and um, kitten biscuits, something like that's going to be perfect for them. Uh, so a few case studies of things uh, that people are doing. Um, so the first one um, is a nice local example. So there might even be people um, here at the conference from Kirtlington. Uh, so the Kirtlington Hedgehog Street is a really nice example of um, a community coming together um, and making really positive changes for hedgehogs. Uh, so this was uh, what is a community project that's run by the Kirtlington Wildlife and Conservation Society. Um, and they didn't just create a hedgehog highway, they made a super highway. <laughs> um, so they linked together over 60 gardens in the village. Um, and include the village pub, the church and the school. Uh, they've used footprint tracking tunnels to monitor activities and also um, camera traps as well. Uh, they also do nature walks and talks for local residents. So really trying to, to get families and people in the village involved and kind of let them know what they're doing. Um, one issue that they've had in Kirtlington is that there's gardens that are on different levels. So there's height changes between gardens. Uh, so they've had to be a little bit creative because it's quite an unusual situation. Um, so you can see on the right hand side there, they uh, created a hedgehog uh, stairway between two gardens. So I think there was a height difference of about a foot um, and they put in this this stairway, which is fantastic. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see down that on that right hand side bottom picture. Um, yeah, that was used um, as there was a hedgehog using using this lovely staircase, which is fantastic. Um, and another example of that, there was a garden that had a height change of a few feet. So you can see on the right hand side there how high that ramp is. That's that's beside me. Um, I went to village. I went to visit the village a couple of a uh, couple of months back. Uh, so they built this fantastic ramp, which was it's just such a good idea um, because the yeah obviously the the garden next door started at this higher height. So they go through that gap and there's they're just straight on ground level in the next garden. Um, so yeah, they, they put this ramp in, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, it was used. So that's a hedgehog going up that ramp, which is absolutely fantastic. I just love that video. I think that went viral on Twitter. 
Um, so yeah, it just goes to show they do use these hedgehog highways, even if there's slightly unusual hedgehog highways, they do use them. This, this lovely connected environment is going to be really good for them. So that ramp, I think it was just made out of wood and then they, they just made sure that the, um, the ramp part was sort of grippy. I think they, they sort of made sure that it was, it had a bit of friction so the hedgehogs aren't just sliding down. Uh, so another case study is a bit more of a um, a bit more of an urban project. So just a nice a nice contrast. Um, so this is a group that's based in um, Putney and Roehampton in West London. Um, some of the key elements of their work um, they attend local events, really trying to raise awareness of of hedgehogs um, because there are hedgehogs in that area. I think people just assume that they're not in London, but of course you know wildlife is everywhere. Uh, so they're raising awareness of hedgehogs and how people can help. Uh, they organise local surveys and they speak to local groups, so kids groups, scouts, guides, things like that. Um, and that top right picture there um, is the group leader, Jackie, and that's one of her lovely um, hedgehog information stores. So she really gets out and chats to the local community and just uh, yeah, lets people know what they can do. One minute left. Lovely, thank you. Just about finished, that's perfect. <laughs> uh, so another element of our work is um, working with developers. Uh, so we partnered with Taylor Wimpy last year, obviously one of the biggest house builders in the UK, and they've pledged to install hedgehog highways in um, all of their development sites, um, which is really good. They're also going to be putting hedgehog houses in green spaces within developments, really trying to increase the nesting opportunities, and they're raising awareness internally as well. So they've had lots of um, events uh, and competitions for staff. Um, so that's uh, another element of our work. Right. Yeah, so just one last video of the coziest hedgehog in the world having a yawn. And then that brings us nicely to the end of my talk. So thanks so much for listening. A uh, few few contact details there. We've got the website um, of Hedgehog Street and the map. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Grace. Really interesting talk. Um, good to see that you're finding that there is some improvement in the population in the urban areas. Um, I guess a bit concerning about the rural ones. Um, we had a question come in from Matthew Bond saying, in an ideal world, what would you want rural land managers to be doing to help those rural he hedgehogs? Uh, so there's a lot of different things that people can do in rural areas. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more sort of complicated in gardens. It's, it's you know, it's hedgehog highways, lovely wildlife friendly features. Um, but in rural areas, um, we'd things like uh, hedgerows, trying to sort of have um, lots of nice native, well-managed hedgerows. That's going to benefit um, hedgehogs and lots of other species as well. That's going to be really good for the actual land. Um, trying to um, sort of have retaining areas of scrub, things like that. Uh, we've actually produced um, a rural land management um, sort of guidance leaflet. So you can find that, I think, if you go on the Hedgehog Street website and you do a quick search for farmer advice, and we've put everything together um, in one place so that people have got a nice resource they can access. Um, and that links to how um, it links it all in with uh, the countryside stewardship scheme as well. And then hopefully further down the line, we'll link that in with Elms as well. And that's when that's all ready to go. OK, good. Thank you. Um, uh, Kurnow, Kurnow Conservation were interested around hedgehog houses. I think they've seen a lot of these woven type ones are everywhere in garden centres and things and not especially good for hedgehogs. Is there any way of making it more wider known? Yeah, so it's these um these igloo type ones, isn't it? There's mm. there's been a bit of um yeah, because I think there was a couple of stories where hedgehog spines were getting stuck in them and it was mm. it was causing all sorts of problems. Um I know that my colleagues at the Hedgehog Society were, were looking into this and, and just doing doing a few tests on different different types and just seeing what if they could sort of narrow down what the what the problem was is it the weave is it you know are they too high so um it's we don't tend to recommend that type of house at the moment um but yeah it's it's something that we're, we're looking into a little bit more um but really what you'd want with a hedgehog house is either a tunnel entrance or some kind of dividing wall inside because what you can get with those igloo ones and with others that are just sort of a box is that predators so things like foxes can just reach in um, but if they've got that tunnel entrance or a dividing wall on the inside, it just adds that extra level of protection. So that's I, I would say that's kind of the key thing to, to look for if you're looking for a hedgehog house. Thank you. Uh, related, uh, uh, Linda Seward was asking 
Uh, when's the best time to clean out the hedgehog house? She's not done it for two or three years. Uh, so trying to avoid um, the hibernation season. So we, we sort of say April, but now, to be honest, now is probably fairly safe to, to do that because obviously it's it's so, it's so mild at the moment. <laughs> um, so just trying to avoid uh, the vulnerable season. So hibernation, so that kind of winter period, um, but then moving more into spring and summer. So kind of when you get to M May or June, that's when they would potentially have hoglets in there. Um, so trying to kind of miss those seasons so kind of march time that's when we'd be expecting them to be awake from hibernation and a little bit more active and um, so cleaning cleaning the box out around then and maybe a little bit later in the season so sort of october but just make sure that the box isn't occupied so you can just either use a trail camera or you can just put a little twig across the entrance um, and that'll just let you know if, if, if the twig's knocked out of the way it means that something's living in there so okay. thank you um, and one Quick question. Uh, Duncan Fisher was asking um, if he's using Mammal Mapper or Project Splatter apps to record road kill, for example. Do those records make it to Hedgehog Street? I don't think they do make it to Hedgehog Street, but I know that they all get fed in fed into the MBN Atlas. So I think it's okay. I know that we've worked previously with Project Splatter and I, I I feel like they might share records with us, um, but we don't have records from Mammal Mapper, but they all kind of end up in the same place. So um, it should be fine. But yeah, do try and use the, do try and use Hedgehog Street because that's, it's quite nice if we've got all the information in one place, because we do keep records from from various local projects. So it's quite nice if we've got, um, yeah, got everything in one place. But I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure we do have projects splatter on there from memory. Great, thank you. So thanks for your presentation. And thanks for answering those questions. Um, 